Good morning. Welcome to the Edward Christian Church. Everybody stand up. Everybody, I want to say stand up. Stand, stand up. Let's say this together. Let's, this is truly how to make America great again by following this. Say it with me. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their Man, 2 Corinthians 7 and 14. Thank God good. Go get a little hand clap of praise. All right. Listen to me. This is much bigger than politics. We're in a crisis as a nation. We need God to intervene, no matter our political viewpoint. Let us join together and seek God. Give on another hand clap. Amen. I'm going to pray for Israel. Just how wonderful is your grace, Savior of those who seek at your right hand, refuge from their foes, protect them like the pupil of your eye, hide them in the shadow of your wings, from the wicked who are selling them, from their deadly enemies who are all around them. God is awesome. Remember this, the church is not an audience to be entertained, it's an army to be trained and to be empowered. Amen? Amen. Let's say this together. These are the two most important hours of my week. Help me to cherish you. I'm here today to worship, not to be entertained. I'm singing to an audience of one, except my worship. Oh, Lord, give on another hand clap of praise. Time to receive a tithe and offering. Y'all say this with me. Put your offering in your hand if you got it. Enjoy your heart. You have it. Already put it out there. <clears throat> put it in your hand and hold it up. If you've already put it out there, put your hand up. <clears throat> say this with me. I lift my offering to you. Let it please you, O oh Lord. This is my seed. I will leave my hand. It will never leave my life. You will multiply, accept my seed, O oh Lord. Give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Praise the Lord. Saints, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Does anybody have an outspoken request this morning? I've left a hand, special needs, lost loved ones, discussion. Father, we thank you for the time and opportunity to be in your house and draw close unto you. Father, we pray. Your word says that you would draw close unto us. Father, there are many needs this morning. And your word says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Lord, we just pray for deliverance in each and every request this morning, spoken and unspoken alike. Show yourself strong, let your people see it. We may further believe and depend upon you in all things and give testimony of what you've done in our lives. Now be with us in the remainder of this service this day. Prepare our hearts to receive your word and appoint the pastors he delivers, Father. We thank you for everything that's said and done. In Christ Jesus' name, the church said, yeah. Amen. Yeah.
that you are alive and you are well and we give it all to you in the name of Jesus we pray and the church said amen you can be seated God is so good I heard about it you know we've been we had a revival uh, Christy Overton uh, has this I don't know if I've ever seen this Victorious Living magazine but she's the uh, person that, that actually started this Victorious Living ministry and it's to inmates and so we were been at, uh, me and Benny have been at Pitt Detention Center a couple of days this week. And we showed him that the old men still got it, didn't we, Benny? Of course, I did introduce him as my granddaddy one time. <laughs> so me and Benny still got it, amen? And so uh, uh, God's doing something. If God can move in a detention center where guys can't get out, what can he do for us? We got freedom and we can move around, Amen? But there was a condemned prisoner awaiting execution, not at Pitt. A condemned prisoner was awaiting execution, and he was granted the usual privilege of choosing the dishes he wanted to eat for his last meal. He ordered a large mess of mushrooms. Why all the mushrooms and nothing else, inquired the guard. Well, said the prisoner, I've always wanted to try them, but I was afraid to eat them before. <laughs> Okay, y'all get it in a minute. All right. Okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get in here to uh, let's see here. Here we go. We're gonna do spiritual warfare, and now again we're in Ephesians chapter six. And we're talking about armor up. We got a few more messages after we talk about the armor, and then we're gonna go probably into the twelve steps because the twelve steps is not just for people that are. Uh, having substance abuse problems, there's a lot of people that have just got uh, problems, okay? And they need God to help them. Everybody in here, matter of fact, has got things that you're dealing with. And so instead of just giving the 12 steps to just to throw them out there to the, to the people that, that we think need it, how about to us who we all need it? We all need it. Plus, if you see it, you might be get a chance to keep some notes and, and use it for some people that you know that may be having some type of substance abuse. All right? So just to quickly go over this, 
And I won't stay long on this. Who shall send us? Who shall ascend? And of course, Isaiah said, send me. Uh, we are supposed to occupy until he comes. That does not mean take up space. That literally means take a stance. Get ready to do battle. Get ready to do spiritual warfare. And then, uh, here it is. You can get through this, not because you're strong, but because God is strong. Amen? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Here we go. Here's where we started last week. And here's where we're going to... We're going to start here. We're going to move pretty quickly, though, so be ready. The devil knows. The devil knows that he cannot stop the church. He cannot stop the building of God's church. He says, And I send you, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But he's going to try. Notice I say try. Sometimes he wins, sometimes he doesn't. It does not depend on him. It depends on you and how much you trust God. Although he can't stop the building of God's church, he can stop the movement of God's church. So how many has been stopped lately? Maybe not by a direct spiritual attack that you can see, but maybe he got you distracted on something else. He got you doing something that mean, did not mean a hill of beans, or you got caught up in things that didn't even matter. To neglect things that mattered the most. So he can try to stop the movement of God's church. The Bible says that we are not ignorant of his devices. Why does it mean not to be ignorant of his devices? Get ready real quickly. These are personal attacks that the devil brings against us. Uh, he does it through any means to destroy the mission of the church. He wants to destroy you. Somebody look at somebody and say he wants to destroy you. 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 He desires to affect your thinking so that he can affect your life, so that he can affect your relationships. And when he affects him, he can infect how you think and your life and your relationships. So now, this is quickly. I'm trying to go through it quickly. Last week we stopped and camped out. We're not camping out. Okay. Blessed be the Lord my, my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. I think about that when I'm playing that bass. My fingers are fighting. My hands are warring. 2 Timothy 2 and 3. There, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, how many, as soon as you get one little hunger pain, you're stopping and getting you a snack? Don't raise your hand. How many, as soon as you feel a little bit of heat, you're turning up, you're bumping up the thermostat? How many, if you're tired of walking, you go ahead and jump in the car? You see, we've been so used to having all these conveniences at our side. You know, I was talking with uh, an inmate the other day, and he said, I, and, and of course, he wasn't begging me for money. I was counseling him. But he told me, he said, he doesn't have any extra money given to him because he doesn't know anybody here. And so he just eats what they bring him. And he said, every now and then, somebody on the in the pod uh, because they get money give to them on their account they get snacks and every now and then somebody will come up to them and get them a snack and he says and so I happen to notice there's some guys in there that actually put on a lot of weight there's some guys that didn't put on any weight the guys that not put on any weight are the guys that don't have any money to put on canteen those guys have got plenty of money for canteen you know they're doing good <clears throat> because not only are they eating the food that's provided, they're providing their own food along the way. Again, even in prison, <clears throat> if you're not careful, we've got so many conveniences. Do you know that? <laughs> do you know that in the Pitt Ascension Center, every pod has a snack machine? There's a snack machine. If you've got money on your card, you can take. Your number, punch it in, and if you've got enough money, you can get a snack out of the snack machine. Again, and they've got tablets where they can watch stuff. Again, conveniences has killed us. So, many times when God has called us to get in spiritual warfare, if we're not careful, if we're called to go beyond the convenience, many times we stop. We don't keep on going because we don't have, 
We've got that convenience attitude. He says, let me tell you something. You need to endure this hardness because this is not a playground. This is a battleground. So, again, I'm, I'm going through it quickly, going through it quickly. Uh, remember, in spiritual warfare, he says, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I'm not going to expound on this. I'm just going to throw it up there. Uh, for those that weren't here last week, there's two types of power mentioned in the scripture and these two types of power is ability or dunamis and uh, and that's what it's talking about satan the power of satan and it's talking about us the authority that we have over his power now there, there's two types of attacks according to this one is serpents which goes out to your cardiovascular system kills you deader than a doornail and then there's the scorpions who just mess up your central nervous system and you have an inability to function properly so, but we have protection. It's just not us trying to figure it out on our own. The weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. So here it is. Get ready. What we realize that we are equipped for the battle. Put on the whole armor of God. And when Paul does this, he tells us this is not pick and choose, peri, uh, cherry pick. He tells us it's not a suggestion. Pick up. And put on the whole armor of God. Take immediate action. You know, now they have these uh, devices that come on our television. And we have these devices on radios. And even now on our cell phone it says a hurricane. We're having a hurricane warning. Or we're having a tornado uh, warning. You can even watch uh, DC's hurricane hacks. If you look on public television, you got, this is D.C. Linton, I'm emergency manager for the county, and he tells you how to handle hurricanes, and it goes on back and forth. But see, we've got all that, and so we know to get the shelter, know to get ready. He says here, put on the armor now, don't wait till you get in the battle. Can you imagine playing pro football and wait until about halfway through the game to put on your shoulder pads? It'd be pretty rough, wouldn't it? Put it on now. Put it on before it starts. Now put on the whole armor of God. So again, this is quickly trying to get through here. I want to get it. There's three types of categories, okay? Three, three types, and each category has its own merit. And so we started in the first part of this category last week, and we're going to finish that up. First, the loin girt with truth. That's the belt. This belt that you put on you, this belt was used to hold all the other armor in place. You had to wear this belt. Many guys wore this belt even when they weren't in warfare. They wore it all the time because they never knew when they were going to need to go to war and they were going to need to take care of business. So this is the armor of consistency. Loins girt with truth. What it did was it provided freedom because it held all your weapons. It held food. It held drink. Uh, your armor would fit into it so your armor wouldn't be loose. And so, and you could also, that's support, and you could also take your, if you're wearing a longer skirt, you could gird it up and put it around you and you could run. So it held weapons, it held metal, metals. First Peter 1 and 3 says, gird yourself or gird afresh up the loins of your mind. I mean, stay. DC was talking about the Bible this morning. I loved it. He says, and he got through talking. He said, I'm going I'm to have to I'm have to watch this. I've been studying the Bible too much. You really can't study it too much. Matter of fact, I'm proud of him for having those Bible studies every day with the emergency management people. That's really, really awesome. John 8, 44 says, Our enemy is a liar. There's a difference in fact and truth. Fact says man's heavy in the water, but truth says come. Here we go. Get ready. Now. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Do you know that the breastplate was the most beautiful piece of personal armor that a Roman soldier had? Not only was it the most beautiful, I'm going to explain to you in a minute, it was also the heaviest piece of armor. It weighed about 40 pounds. Now let me explain this armor. Usually there was two sheets. Start with, you would put on a leather sheet that would go over you. This leather sheet then would hold this armor. 
you had one type of metal on front, one type of metal on back, and you had uh, a brass ring that held this armor. Then you had something like a coat of mail that would go around this breastplate. It would be under the breastplate. It would go around this breastplate, and it was interlocking. So all the pieces interlocked, and you had these pieces of silver and brass rings. Now, this is what's so awesome about this silver and brass rings. I love it. Is that this armor, as the soldier began to march, the brass and the silver would start rubbing against each other. And as the brass and the silver started rubbing each other, when they got in the sun, it would shine. When Roman soldiers marched, they had a special cadence. And when they marched, they would just keep on going at a certain way they would go, and they would keep on marching. They marched in step. And if people fell in front of them, it didn't matter. They just went over top of them. They kept on marching. Many times before they ever, you ever saw the enemy, you could hear the breastplate. You could hear it shifting as they walked. Not only could you hear it shifting, you could see those coats of mail that was connected to it with the silver and the brass coming against each other and shining. And because it shone so bright many times, they never had to lift a sword to take a place. All they had to do was show up. Because when they showed up, the soldiers were heard by the other people. The soldiers, as they marched, they heard that armor. They saw the brightness of those two metals rubbing against each other. And when they saw this, people would go, we don't want any of this. And they would give up without a fight. Now let me bring it to us a little bit here. The breastplate. Of righteousness. I heard multiple times while I was in the detention center this week, taking all these people around, me and Benny and another and Brother Pollock one day and uh, another guy another day, but we were moving everybody around me and, and as we're moving all these guys around, there was one guy that used to play with Johnny Cash. He's in there singing and playing for the guys. He was awesome. And the first couple of pods that we went into, each pod had about 40 or 50 guys. Each pod that we went into, I would hear him say, I was raised in the church where I got beat down every Sunday. He said, I never thought I was good enough, and I spent so much time repenting every Sunday. And I said, Obviously, he was in a legalistic church. Finally, at the last pod that we went to, he finally said it. He said, I was in a legalistic Pentecostal church, and every Sunday they beat us down and told us that we weren't living right, and they just beat us up and said we'd all get in order and pray for an hour or so because we just didn't feel we were worthy. And that we were not saved. Can you imagine coming to church every Sunday and getting whooped? Can you imagine coming here and when you leave here you go, wow, I, I feel terrible. So many times, what we consider righteousness, get ready, is not God's righteousness. It's self-righteousness. And when you find yourself judging everybody else to your standard, guess what? That's not righteousness. That's self-righteousness. And when somebody can't live up to your standard... Matter of fact, when many people can't live up to your standard, you better check yourself. 
because you may be caught up in self-righteousness, which is what a lot of people call legalism. I'm saved by my works. I'm saved by, you know, we're going to compare each other and see who's the holiest. Let me explain something about righteousness. Martin Luther says, our works do not generate righteousness. Rather, our righteousness in Christ generates work. Well, what does that say? And let's, let's just go here. Let's look at it a little bit. Here's some fancy words. I, I, theology. I took a lot of theology, even in this last uh, diploma that I got, this degree I got in psychology because it was at a Christian school, that I, I had to go through this a lot. And, and sometimes theology could be very, very hard because it wasn't about necessarily the Bible. It was about the people that wrote about the Bible, what they were thinking, and blah, 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 blah. And that used to, I used to drive me crazy. I said, just tell me about the Bible, and let's talk about the Bible. So this is about the Bible. It's theology, but it's the study of God, and here it is. How many in here are saved? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody's saved. All right. If you're saved, and I believe you are, I'm not judging, I'm telling you, I'm trying to help you out here. Did you know that you've got <laughs> imputed righteousness? Let me get this out here so we can look at it. Imputed. I didn't say puked, I said imputed. Imputed righteousness by faith, Romans 4 and 3. For what said the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. I like the message version. While we read in scriptures, Abraham entered into what God was doing for him. And that was the turning point. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. Wow. We can live a lot freer life if we can figure this out. Quit trying it. Quit trying to, to make everything perfect. Here it is again. Abraham entered into what God was doing for him, and that was the turning point. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. That is imputed righteousness. Matter of fact, how many's ever heard, you see me say it many times preaching, how many's ever heard of being justified? Justifiable grace. I preach it at a mass. Justifiable grace. Justifiable means just if I'd never done it. Justified. Just if I'd never done it. This is justifiable grace. It's not what I can do on my own to please God. It's what God does through me and helps me. So that's imputed righteousness. Now let's go, let's go one further here. And let's go to the 8th chapter, the 4th church, the 4th verse. Imparted righteousness. There's imputed righteousness or justification. Then there's imparted righteousness where that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If we just walk by the law, we're walking by the flesh. But when we walk by the Spirit, that's a whole different ballgame. And again... I, I, I want to want to read this uh, first, the the amplified version, so that the righteousness, the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live and move not in the ways of the flesh, but all but in the ways of the spirit. Our lives governed not by standards and according to the dictates of the flesh, but controlled by the Holy Spirit. The message version. I love it. And now. What the law code asked for but we could not deliver is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our efforts, oh, God, listen to that. I can't be good enough, so tomorrow I'll try even more to be good enough. I remember when I first got saved, and I was in a legalistic church, and I remember every Sunday morning, after the preacher, I was out there playing music, I'd even do a devotion or whatever when, when they get through. 
after every sermon, I get up in that altar and pray for 30 minutes to an hour because I didn't feel like I was good enough. Now, what the law code asked for, and we could not deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Wow. Don't say sanctification. Justification gets us ready for heaven. Sanctification gets us ready to walk this earth and show people how God works in us. And so that's justification, that's sanctification, and it is demonstrated by our response to both of these. Quit trying to be perfect. You will never, ever achieve it. Instead, do your best to please God. That's it. Please God. If you live a life that pleases God, then you will be justified and you will be sanctified because God now is living in you, through you, and your whole response is different. So now, the devil would love to tell you today that's for somebody else that's not for me because I'm not good enough I've been too bad I've been too wrong I keep trying to reach this mark and I can't reach it and God says quit trying you know I sent out a little thing I should have put it up here where the two kids Actually, my wife sent it to me, and I sent it out because it looked like D.C. and Daniel. They were, the kids were trying to reach a cabinet way up above, so, they, so one kid put the other kid on the top of a trash can that you push the button, and the lid pops up. He's going to shoot his brother up to get him the snack. That would be a D.C. Daniel 100%. D.C. would be running the controls, mission control, mission control, to Daniel, Mercury 1, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. I've seen him throw him. It's amazing how when I can't reach it, God reaches down and picks me up and holds me up so I can reach it. I like Bethany. The very first time we went, the very first time we went to vacation after we had it, we went to the mountains. We were up on Grandfather Mountain, and they had a roller coaster. And she said, Daddy, can I ride that roller coaster? I said, sure. And there was a sign that said, if you weren't that tall, you couldn't ride. And I'd already seen her walk by, and she weren't tall enough. So what I did was she just missed, just missed it. And so when she went to get, the guy went to check her, I grabbed her by the seat of her pants and pulled her up. And he said, you're tall enough. And that started an infatuation with roller coasters for all my kids. How many times has God grabbed you by the seat of the pants and picked you up because you couldn't do it on your own? You didn't measure up. So God says, I got you. I got you. I got you. I got it. So now, let's move a little further. Next, he says, in your shoes... For your feet, having put on a readiness given by the gospel of peace, or it says, that's another version, but it says, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then here, here, here's, a, here's a crazy one now I want you to watch. First, you got your loins girded with truth. You got the breastplate of righteousness. And then you got your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I want to stop there. Sometimes we forget about the feet shod. Why in the world is your feet shod? I've seen people come up and their feet stunk. We were having homecoming, homecoming. We were having foot washing. 
one night at Benson, and, and the ladies were in the fellowship hall. They had all kinds of room. They were laughing and praising God and shouting and running around. And we had a little bitty Sunday school room, all the guys. I told everybody we were having foot washing that night. And I told D.C. and Daniel, don't forget to wash them feet. And when we got in that room, we had to shut the door. When we shut the door, they took off their shoes. And when I saw their feet, I said, oh, God. And D.C.'s foot was so big, they had to put it in this way and pull it out and then stick that in. in. And it looked like they hadn't washed their feet in a week. It wasn't bad enough to look at it, the smell. And I said, Lord, I understand what true servanthood is. Because I'm going to do this if i got to hold my nose. I'm going to do this. If i got to close my eyes, I'm going to do this. Now, so his feet shod, not washed, shod. The Roman soldier, when he put on his shoe, he had to tie him tight, tight, tight. John Wooden, UCLA. Won seven straight national titles. Had won 88 straight games without a loss. He didn't go scout the team. He said, let them scout us because we'll make them play our game. Greatest coach of all times, even greater than Coach K. I know y'all didn't think I would say that, but he was. Coach K learned under him. Well, directly under him, Knight. He learned under Knight, but, I mean, he learned a lot from this guy. And he believed in fundamentals. And the very first thing he taught his guys is get a shoe that fits, get socks to keep your feet dry, and tie them shoes tight. Before anything else, before you shot the ball, before you walked on the court, get some shoes that fit, make sure you got good laces, you got good socks, and you tighten down them shoes, and you keep them tight the whole game. That's shot. Feet shot. Now, the Roman soldier was not, not wearing sneakers. Not at all. We'll get that in just a minute. But it said, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, preparation is a very powerful word, too. Because it comes from the idea of readiness. Ready at all times. They never knew when they were going to have an ambush. They never knew when they were called to ambush somebody else. They never knew when the battle was going to come on them at a moment's notice. So keep your shoes tight and be ready at all times. Tighten up your shoes and be ready with the gospel of peace. Now let me just go up a little bit more into these shoes. These are special shoes. These shoes had two parts. There was the shoe, and there were the greaves. If you watch a World War II veteran, what do you always see on his pants leg? You always see, it looks like a great little big sock that's pulled up around here. You know what that was? That was a greave. The Roman soldier had those shoes that were tight, and they were wearing greaves that were tight. Because in battle, when the enemy was fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, there's two things they would do. They would kick you in your shin, and if you fell down, they would stomp your leg to break it. And so you put on this metal sheath to protect that leg against the kicks and against the breaks. And the shoe itself was special. They had spikes on the sole. Depending on where they're fighting, their spikes went from one inch 
to three inches. It was fixed when it's tight against their foot. No terrain would be too hard for them to climb or to walk on. But not only that, when they're in warfare, they can take the spikes of that soul and they can kick a shin and they can tear a shin all to pieces. And when the person falls down, they can take that shoe that's got brass under it and got those soles and can crush a leg. And once they break that leg and the man can't stand, they can take him down. Wow, that's some powerful stuff. Protect your legs, protect your feet, give you sure foot. I wanted to say it's probably good, but I wanted to wait. The God of peace, that word peace there is urane. Urania, the gospel of peace, the God of peace. The gospel of peace, what it's talking about with your feet shod, means to bind together that which has been separated. To bind together that which has been broken. To put it back together. And to have an overwhelming, confident faith that you and God are all right. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise a hand right now. But if I was to ask you right now, do you have an overwhelmingly confident faith that you and God are all right? Don't raise your hand. Because there's no reason not to. Because God's peace and his gospel, the good news, gives you sure footing and protects you in the battles. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That word shortly doesn't mean a space of time. That word shortly is talking about how the Roman soldiers marched. When a Roman soldier marched, they marched in perfect time. Here they are. You got this breastplate of righteousness, this breastplate shining in it's shining and it's not going anywhere because it's hooked to the belt. So you got it shining front and back, it's shining and it's glittering and it's making noise and people see it when the Roman soldiers, the legions come marching up. They've got on these metal greaves and they got these shoes on with these big spikes and they're marching. And shortly is the cadence that they used. Look at that. Shortly. And once they got the cadence, they didn't stop. Somebody could fall in front of them, and they walked over them. Animals could get in the way, they marched over them. They come over something in the middle of the road, they marched over it. Because once they got marching, they were equipped to take care of business. If you can learn to take care of business, and you can learn to march with that breastplate of righteousness imputed and imparted, it's not my own, and to build a truth, and I got my feet, they're covered with the gospel, they're tight, my shoes are tight. Nike never made anything like this, and I can learn just to march and never stop. Don't let little things get in the way, little attitudes get in the way, little fears get in the way, thinking we can't do it get in the way, thinking somebody's going to get me get in the way, thinking I'm not good enough, thinking they're not good enough. Just whatever you think, just keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. God, the God of peace, Urania will bruise Satan under your feet because when he tries to stop you, guess what you're going to do? You're going to march over him. How long has it been since you just marched over him and said, ah.
Martin Luther, of course, was a priest. And when he started Lutheranism, of course, they didn't call it Lutheranism to start with, just Protestant. When he started it, he married a nun. So him and this nun, they're doing this new movement with Protestant versus Catholicism, uh, Protestantism, meaning to protest. He was protesting what the Catholics were saying. And so because he protested, they, they called it Protestantism. Pro, pro, you know what I'm talking about. Protestantism. And he was having a hard time one day because he was just so depressed. And he walked around, and he walked around, and he walked around, and he got all the mother grubs. I mean, he'd already faced death because they said, we're going to kill you if you don't stop, and he kept on going. He faced all grades of ridicule, but he kept on going. And then finally something happened, and he quit going. We're going to kill you, Martin Luther, if you don't stop this mess that you got going on. He said, the just shall live by faith. We're going to kill you, Martin Luther, if you don't stop trying to build churches. He said, the just shall live by faith. He said, we're going to give you 24 hours to think about it. He said, give me all you want. I'm not going to stop. The just shall live by faith. And then something hit him. And he slowed down like Elijah. And he walked around for days. And what I call the mully grubs. And his wife came up to, her, to him, and she was dressed all in black. He looked over at his wife and said, uh, who died? She said, God did. He said, I'm sorry, what did you say? Who died? She said, God did. He said, have you lost your ever love of mine? God is not dead. God is alive. He's more alive than he's ever been. God is alive. He's, a, he's working for his people. God is alive. And she said, well, why don't you act like it? You see those Roman movies? The Roman, the centurion and all those guys going? Shortly. Short step. Shortly. Short step. You see, God hadn't leave, left us out here alone. He's looking for somebody that'll march into the fire, that'll take care of business. It's time to put on his armor, spread the message, don't be afraid. He's recovered. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You may see yourself as that guy just standing there with his hand in his pocket, the Bible in the other hand, and the arrows are coming. But Satan sees that, so does God. Stand there with your shield, with your armor on. At least he can replace something. Don't fall for Satan's lies. Tell you you're not good enough. You don't have enough. You can't do this. You can't do that. You're, you're incapable. You're blah, 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 blah. He'll come up with all kinds of lies. Because here's what you got. You got God's truth in his word. You got God's righteousness within you. And you got God's peace guarding your heart. God's got us. God's got us. God's got us. I want everybody to stand. You know, how many seen the pictures of Rodanthem and those houses falling on in the water? Y'all seen them? Those million dollar houses that everybody's paying all this money to get. Now you can get them a product for ten dollars. Houses falling in the water.
because they were built on sand. God tells us to build on the rock. <laughs> the belt of truth, that's the rock. The breastplate of righteousness. It protects the vital organs, protects my heart, my lungs, my kidneys. My spirit is protected because I got his righteousness. And when I march, I can mean business. Because I don't have to be perfect. He is. Don't fall for legalism. Don't fall for this. I'm never good enough stuff. You are more than enough through him. Every morning when my wife and I pray, I always end that part of our prayer with, Lord, to make us more than enough to meet these challenges. Make us more than enough. When I'm praying for y'all, I say, Lord, make them more than enough to meet their challenges. Every head bowed, every eye closed. With every head bowed, every eye closed. How many in here would be bold I mean, really bold. So, Pastor, I've been falling for the lies of Satan telling me I'm not good enough. Telling me I'm not going to win. And telling me that my life is no good. Nobody looking around. We just put aside that hand if I've been listening to the lies of the enemy. I'm tired of listening. I'm tired of listening. My challenge today is put on that belt plate, I mean, belt of truth and the breastplate of God's righteousness. Not yours. God's righteousness. And let that good news. Of peace. Bind together that which has been broken. There was a time me and God had a broken relationship. It's not broken anymore. He's got us. He's got us. He's got us. If you're here today, I'm just going to do this. I want y'all to pray with me. I'm just going to do this. Y'all pray with me. Just pray with me. Lord, I rededicate my life to you. I can't do it on my own. And I definitely have a hard time with the lies of the enemy bombarding me all the time that I'm not good enough. Lord, I thank you because I can let you be good through me. I can let you be righteous through me. I thank you, God, for justification. I thank you, God, for sanctification. And I thank you, God, that with you I am good enough. Let's pray some more. Lord, Take me as I am. I'm yours. Shine through me. Help me to march with you. And to know it's not in vain. I give it all to you. Right now. Not by my feeling, but by my faith. In the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Now, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. And after we say the Lord's Prayer, let me ask Brother Steve to dismiss us in prayer. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Yep. Thank you. 